Thank you much, so much for joining us here at Franklin. Specifically, here we are at a house called Carnton, and we are going to show you a little bit of the house before we go out and talk about the terrible aftermath and the sort of the early memorialization of the Franklin battlefield. And let's pop it right over to uh, CEO of the Battle of Franklin Trust, Eric Jacobson. So we are in what we interpret as Winder's room. Winder was John and Carrie McGavick's young son. So Carnton was built in the late 1820s. The McGavick family lived here for decades before the war. But it is in this room that we interpret the hospital scene in some great detail. Uh, this becomes William Loring's field hospital. So many of those guys who were moving across this ground toward the U.S. left flank, wounded, brought back here. During the course of the night, there are hundreds of men um, brought to Carnton, some inside the house, some outside. Visitors who, who come here usually never forget this scene. The blood stains that, that cover the floors here next to the makeshift table, certainly where a surgeon or several worked. Um, we try and, and, and give guests a, a real good sense of of not just what was happening that night, but what a dedicated group of people the medical staff was. You know, I think they really get short thrift. These guys were saving about three out of four patients who came through. They lot of, learned a lot through mistakes in the first half of the war. So it's, it's really, I think, just a, a wonderful place. I, I often say Carnton and the Pry House um, near Antietam are the best hospital sites left over from the American Civil War. So it's just a really unique experience here. You're going to have the chance to get an inside look here behind the scenes, a fantastic house building, one of three that the Battle of Franklin Trust manages at this point. Tell us a little bit about that. So we manage Carnton and Carter House and have since uh, 2009. We started managing Ripa Villa earlier um, in 2021, and they're just all part of the Spring Hill Franklin experience, so we're just honored to do so. But what we're going to do, let's head downstairs. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna go down. We're on the second floor, so we're going to end up down on the first floor. We're going to go out on the porch, but just if you can, I mean, and it's a real brief look, but this house was completely filled on the night of the battle. Wounded everywhere, probably 20, 30 men, 40 in every room. They're laying on the steps that we're walking on right now. They're all throughout the hallway down here on the first floor. There are probably two or 300 men outside. You know, it's easy to forget when we talk about 10,000 casualties. Sometimes you have to break it down. And Loring has almost a thousand casualties. He loses a couple of hundred who were killed. He probably has seven to eight hundred wounded, about a hundred are captured. And so this is just a scene of incredible chaos. And as if the night of the battle wasn't bad enough, the morning of December 1st, so the sunlight exposes what the darkness had hidden. And on the morning of the 1st, Look at that, I just dropped the key. It's live TV, folks. Now, now, now we're locked in. So what happens on the morning of the 1st is closer to Carter House is a scene of just a complete catastrophe. Several wagons begin to approach Carnton from the northwest, and they're bearing the bodies of four Confederate generals. The best that we've ever been able to ascertain, the reason the generals were brought here, is Carnton was the first place where there was any sort of controlled chaos. It was such a complete and utter ruinous disaster out to the Northwest. They moved the bodies of Pat Claiborne, John Adams, Hiram Granberry, and Otho Strahl here. We think Strahl actually was brought here during the night. The other three are brought very early after sunrise on the 1st of December. The McGavick's daughter, who was nine years old on uh, the night of the battle and lived until the early 1930s. She was the last of the family members to pass away. She remembered the bodies laid here on the porch, on the west end of the porch. Makes sense. Wagons probably pulled up to the end of the porch. She said she remembered the bodies laying beneath the western windows. All four bodies were later taken south for burial and um, three of them were later exhumed and taken home. Granberry went back to Texas, Clyburn went back to Arkansas, and Strahl went out to West Tennessee where he'd lived for about a decade before the war. I think, uh, thanks Eric, I, I just, coming here is unlike other places, uh, you know, and it's become the thing of legend, but only when it's really put together with the larger story of this family, of this house, of this battle, does it even become more meaningful. So yes, you need to come here and sit on the porch, but you really need the whole story. And to do that, really visit the Carter House, visit Ripa Villa, and visit here at Carnton to come to this iconic place. And it, it, it can definitely give you chills. And it's also something that you'll learn a lot about and understand the Civil War just a little bit better.
So I think the I think the last site that we're going to visit, we're going to double back to the cemetery. So it's it's not like the battle was bad enough, right? You know, there's there's just this unbelievable chaos and destruction, the dead, the wounded, the dying, the smell in the air for weeks and weeks. Moscow Carter said he was burning the carcasses of dead horses and mules on Christmas Day, 1864, right? No holiday season that year. And of course, then the war ends. So even though the fighting is ended, there's still this tremendous amount of damage. There are dead buried out on the battlefield, which was just farmland. You know, it was it was owned by the Carters and owned by the McGavicks, and so they had to try and decide what they were going to do in the spring to plant crops. How do you move forward? And there begins this process really throughout the country, north and south, rich and poor, white and black, trying to deal with the issue of death because they're... There are, you know, 700 plus thousand dead. You know, as, as uh, Drew Gilpin Faust pointed out a number of years ago, the good death was destroyed and shattered by the war. And so what do people try to do? They try, to, they try and make some sense of it. They try and create some order. They try and figure out how do we move forward. And the first steps were tending to the dead. So the U.S. government begins the establishment of what, of course, we know as national cemeteries, Gettysburg, Vicksburg, Shiloh, on and on. Of course, Arlington, where Robert E. Lee had once lived, becomes today arguably the most famous of all um, American cemeteries. The Confederate dead, however, were not going to be exhumed by the U.S. government, so they are left to local groups, to family members, etc. There's really something remarkable that happens here in Franklin. About 18 months after the battle, there was a small group formed, and one of the members of this group was John McGavick, who, who owned and lived here at Carton. And so this group decided that they had to try and deal with the dead in an appropriate fashion. Now, to be clear, they're only dealing with the Confederate dead. The U.S. dead were exhumed and moved to the National Cemetery at Stones River um, outside of Murfreesboro. So this group, uh, John McGavick part of, they hired a small team of grave diggers. And when I say small, literally small. It's four guys. Three brothers and a fourth man. There's also, it seems, to a fellow in town who was making small oak boxes, coffins, for the dead to be buried in. And the burial team began work late March, early April of 1866. They worked for nearly three months. They combed the battlefield. They went everywhere, not just on the battlefield, they even went into downtown because some of the men who'd been mortally wounded and had lived for days had died at private residences, etc. Some were buried in the city cemetery. So they were exhuming from there. They were exhuming from the ground close to Carter House, along Columbia Pike. They worked day after day after day. They were able to identify the bulk of the men. Why? When the soldiers were first buried, they were buried right after the battle by their friends, guys who knew them. So they had marked the graves and they had put up small boards and planks, the tops of commissary box and whatnot. They'd carved names and units into these. And so 18 months later, when this burial team begins to comb the field, many of these very crude early markers were still standing. What you see off here to my right is the legacy not just of those who died here, but of the McGavicks and of the small team of men who dedicated nearly three months of their lives to exhuming these men and bringing them here. They buried them in state sections. So you have Texas back here, Tennessee, and if you move on down the line, you've got Missouri and you've got Arkansas, Mississippi, a quarter of the cemetery, Tennessee runs into Alabama and Georgia and South Carolina, Louisiana, a section of unknowns. By the time the exhumations were complete in late June 1866, 1,481 men had been moved here. About 900 were identified. And incredibly, one of those men who was exhuming the dead also is buried here. He died in the midst of the work. His name was Marcellus Cuppet. He was the younger brother of the man who led the burial team, George Cuppet. And it was George Cuppet who I think left behind perhaps the most important thing that still exists in our collection is inside the house. The Book of the Dead, 
He entered all of the names and the units into a small leather-bound journal that guests can see every day if they visit Carnton. And this is truly an incredibly special place. This cemetery is very unique. It is still today one of the two largest Confederate cemeteries that are privately maintained. I mean, there are bigger ones like Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond, but this one has always been privately maintained and to this day, it is uh, still cared for by the local United Daughters of the Confederacy chapter. And it's a telling, it's a telling look at the cost of not just this battle, but I would argue uh, a, a telling look at the cost of our war. And truly, this is what we did to one another for four long years. And it was a man and a woman who lived in that house, who grew old together into their 70s, who maintained this place for the rest of their lives. They died in 1893 and 1905. John went first, Carrie went second. But it's um, in addition to all the reclamation work and all of the efforts that we've put into sort of resurrecting this story like a, like a phoenix coming out of the ashes. Um, this is just a big, big, important, um, sobering piece of that puzzle. So I just want to thank everyone. And if you've got, got a chance, come out, see the cemetery, see Carrington, see Carter House, go to Ripavilla, walk the battlefield, and, and I think truly get a, a, a real good sense of, of how our war finally began to move toward its conclusion. Thanks. Thanks, Eric, and thanks so much for all of your uh, participation in these videos. I won't try to add to that. I'll only add that, uh, I guess I am adding. Uh, you know, if you have 1,400 dead here, you've got three major battles in this part of the state, and countless other smaller skirmishes and battles going on around here, and let's say we total three, four, five thousand, twenty thousand 5,000, 20,000 dead or something. Remember, four wounded for every dead, and this is only one theater of the entire war. So just try to keep that in mind as you grasp the enormity of it, and if you come here, trust me, you will be one of those people who then tells everybody else, you have to come to Franklin. You have to see these things because people speak about this battle, spoke about this battle differently, and they speak about the site, the sites that are here, Carter and Carrington and otherwise, a little differently than everywhere else. It's, it's sobering, but you should come. Uh, thanks again to the Battle of Franklin Trust. Thank you for watching. Thanks to Chris and Chris here, and uh, thank you for supporting battlefield preservation and education.